Welcome to Series 3 of The Great Humbling. What does it mean to be humbled? Perhaps it's to be less proud, to feel less important, even a little defeated. From the Latin humus, ground, to be grounded, and humilis, brought to the ground, made low or lowly. My name's Ed Gillespie, and I'm a poet, futurist, and recovering sustainability consultant. In the early days of the pandemic, I started recording these conversations with the author Dougal Hine, where we wonder together about the strangeness of the times we're in, the altered states into which they push us, and now, in this third series, the new moves that might be called for, if these really are times of being brought back down to earth. Hello there, here we are. Episode 7 of Season 3. We're nearly at the end of another season of The Great Humbling. Wow, here we are again. Ed, what have you been hearing from people this week? Well, there's been uh, lots of listeners' comments about uh, last week's slow and deep sense uh, of, of imploring to small yourself up. Uh, and a lot of it's been around how the toxicity of urgency can manifest itself. You know, where we have the creation of unintended consequences from good intentions and, and that old lady fly swallowing that we can stumble into when we lurch to solutionize. Off the back of that, I also started reading uh, our great friend Martin Shaw's new book, uh, The Smoke Hole, Looking to the Wild in the Time of the Spyglass, uh, which is, as you'd expect, a pretty gripping read. Um, and Martin's using three myths to do what Martin does best, uh, and then some. <laughs> and it's a fantastic sort of illumination of our shadowed world with little mythical sparkles. And we're led by his breadcrumbed words like hungry birds into somewhere more magical, if not necessarily any more comfortable. Mm. And there was one line, actually, which was also picked out by Paul Kingsnorth in his cover quote for the book, uh, which really stopped me in my tracks. And it was like, the mess out there is because of a mess in here. And I know that's a fairly standard inner work sort of mantra in some ways, but it just felt very, very sharp right now, particularly as Martin's book is is all about re-emergence. So the themes are growing our hands back, breaking enchantments and kicking the robbers out of the house. Uh, and I'm sure we'll come back to it in a minute, as we always do. And then there was a, a another... Uh, it, it, email from another listener Rosie Watson who asked me whether our intellectualization of our challenges is in itself a coping mechanism um, whether it helps us avoid the personal aspects and impacts of a world of wounds and in that sense the notion of the work that is mine to do that we touched on the other week is is actually a question of rare and extreme privilege well that's a good meaty question more questions like that, please, listeners. <laughs> now, hello, Rosie. The first thing I thought about when Ed passed on that question was it took me back to the first episode, this series, Keep It Foolish, and Vanessa Andriotti's words about the difference between low-intensity and high-intensity struggles. And she says... In the book, you know, if you've got the time and the resources to be reading this book, then you're in a situation of low intensity struggle. And if you picture yourself in a room full of people whose lives are defined by a struggle for survival, then you look kind of ridiculous and pathetic to them. And actually being with that, accepting your own foolishness might be part of the work that's needed. If you're starting from where oh, the two of us or probably anyone listening to this podcast is starting from. So I'll totally buy the, like, some of the kinds of conversations that we have oh, have that quality of being ridiculous and pathetic from some very real vantage points. I got a mail the other day from Kate Chapman whose poem I read at the end of the last episode. And she wrote to me about privilege as well. And she said something about how maybe what matters is what you do with your privilege. Like feeling guilt or shame 
over our privilege probably doesn't help anyone. And I was having a conversation just before we sat down to record this with Caroline Ross, the artist and Tai Chi teacher who I learn a lot from. And she gave me this distinction between privilege and entitlement. Like, you know, you can and you need to get rid of your entitlement. Getting rid of your privilege isn't as easy or even necessarily the move that is called for. It's that thing of how can you use your privilege and put it into the service of something else. I suppose there's a part of me that would want to push back on the idea that what we do here is about intellectualization (laughs) in as much as I think there is a lot of other stuff going on in these conversations, a lot that's personal. It's about feeling as much as thinking. And then having said that, I'm sure that there are times when we swerve into this terrain of books and references and concepts and words in a way that is an avoidance tactic. So yeah, I will take that. Yeah, rumbled. <laughs> as, as well as humbled. Rumbled and humbled. But I mean, I guess when I've spoken about the work that is mine to do, I, firstly, obviously, And I do say this as often as I can. There's an immense amount of privilege in the things that I get to do in the name of work at this point in my life. But when I think about the people who taught me about the importance of knowing and committing to the work that is yours to do, some of them really weren't coming from anything like the place of privilege that I'm speaking from. And in terms of finding that work, I was taken back to the work of Alistair McIntosh, who made a huge impact on me when I was in my mid-twenties and I screwed up the beginnings of a career at the BBC and was trying to work out what the hell to do with however many years were going to be ahead of me, of my life. And I remember reading then the questions that Alistair still has on the front page of his website. He's got these four questions. Does what I do feed the hungry? Is it relevant to the poor or to the broken in nature? Does it contribute to understanding and meaningfulness? Does it give life? And there's something else that I've heard Alistair say, which is that our work starts from the place where my needs meet the needs of the world. And maybe that's what I've been trying to reach to when I talk about this thing that could sound very entitled, actually, when I talk about the idea of doing the work that is mine to do. So I hope maybe that's a little clearer than the way that I've spoken about these things before. Mm. But I really love to have more questions as we go along that are actually you know, pulling us back on things we've said that maybe haven't made sense or kind of come across in a way that is troubling. So thanks. Thanks for that, Rosie. Mm-hmm. I think that distinction between entitlement and privilege is really useful. Um, my, my instinct on all of this, you know, the mess, the intellectualization and this idea of privilege is to resist some of that, uh, those navel gazing accusations of fiddling while Rome burns and, you know, arguing arcane points of reference because we can and are vastly fortunate enough to be able to do so. And just to remember actually ultimately that attention is a prayer and what what we give our attention to matters and it is in effect what we somehow worship or venerate or value uh and i think that prayer point um perhaps leads us uh seamlessly dougald uh into your opportunity to introduce this week's instruction because i believe it's it's your turn to supplicate yourself humbly at the altar of our groundings uh what should we do this week having smalled ourselves up Yeah, well, this is an episode that I've been wanting to do ever since the idea of a series that's about new moves came together. Today's instruction is get on your knees because we're going to be talking about prayer. Now, as a way into that, I wanted to share a story about something that happened on a call that I have every three weeks or so with a couple of people who've become friends quite recently we just meet for an hour on zoom on a wednesday morning and there's never been an agenda but we keep coming back and it always seems to be worth coming back well the last time we met michael who's the guy who sort of brought the other two of us together voiced a sense that he had of carrying something 
that wants to be brought into the world, that wants to take shape, but not knowing yet what it is exactly. And our friend Deepa said, well, I think we should just offer a blessing for whatever it is that is coming. And now Deepa is trained in a Sufi tradition and she said, we have this blessing. It's one of the names of God and it translates as the door is open. And you say this name seven times and each time you put your hand on your heart and lift it outwards as you speak. So we did just that, the three of us. And to be honest, I was a bit startled by how clearly something happened in the moment of doing this together. And I don't really want to elaborate on that something, to fill it with explanation or even to fill it with mystery. Because it's just to say that these techniques that people have had in all kinds of different times and places, they exist because they do something to us. Anyway, afterwards, I found myself thinking about a particular kind of cultural poverty. Here's the thought that came to me. Have there ever been humans who did so little blessing as they went about their lives, who had so little literacy of blessing? Mm, That is true. I, I mean, I love that the door is open. It's the roomy line, isn't it? People are moving back and forth across the threshold, don't go back to sleep. But, you know, to your point about the sort of the, the poverty of blessings in our lives, it's so true, isn't it? The sort of the lack of grace and gratitude and the absence of the libations and tributes and dedications and offerings. I did an extraordinary shamanic healing uh, with Susie Crockford uh, on, from Dartmoor in lockdown one last year. And it was all done entirely remotely, which again, I won't go into the details of, but it felt very, very powerful. And as part of the thanks for the process, Susie invited me to make a couple of little ritual offerings to the spirits, one to fire and one to water. And so I wrote small illustrated notes and I burnt one in a little metal bowl on my Brixton balcony one night and consigned the other with a flurry of small silver coins into the mighty Thames the following day. And in essence, it just felt like I'd given my attention to the right prayer. It seems to me that blessing is one of a number of moves that fall within the category of prayer. And as I was going around with this thought about this strange kind of cultural poverty of not having a blessing up my sleeve in the way that Deepa did for us in that moment, and of being mostly surrounded by people who don't have a blessing up their sleeves. I remembered that Hans Christian Andersen story about the emperor with no clothes. And the phrase came to me, the empire has no prayers. Mm. And to have no prayers is to be naked, exposed to the elements on some level that corresponds maybe to one of the layers in Blake's layered vision of reality that we spoke about earlier this series. And if the empire has no prayers, then maybe it's also true to say the empire hasn't got a prayer, Mm. which I like as a thought. Now, you might be going, this is absurd, Dougal. I mean, the British Empire was carried to the ends of the earth by missionaries almost as much as it was by gunboats. The Empire doesn't just have a prayer, it has a prayer book and a Bible, and it marches around the world creating written versions of what had previously been entirely oral languages so that it can print Bibles and prayer books and clothe the natives in the forms of Christianity and stamp out their dreadful paganism. (laughs) Yet I want to say that something has died or gone rotten in the kind of prayer that can do that, that can be exported and imprinted on people like that. And if I wanted to build out that thought, then I'd start with an extraordinary book by a man called Dara Malloy, a Celtic monk living on the island of Inish Moor off the coast of Ireland. And he was a Catholic priest for nearly 20 years, He actually baptised an old friend and BBC colleague of mine, Marco Van Bell, and got himself arrested protesting outside the Doyle the same day. 
and Dara became a great friend of Ivan Illich. So I've kept kind of crossing paths with him without ever actually having been in contact with him directly over the years. Various friends of mine have gone and visited him on this island where he lives. And in the mid-90s, he left the Roman Catholic Church while remaining a priest. And he wrote a book with the title, The Globalization of God, which is about the way that the institutionalized church extinguished the local hybrid traditions, such as Celtic Christianity, that were formed out of an encounter with a particular landscape and a particular cultural context. And that in doing this, the church operated as the prototype for colonialism and globalization. And I suppose part of what I'm drawn to in Dara's work is that even as he's saying this, he's also convinced that there are deep wells to be drawn on within the grassroots of religious tradition, including within Christianity. While at the same time, he's articulating a need, as he puts it, to go beyond both monotheism and polytheism. And you know what? I really don't want to try to expound on theology in this episode. <laughs> this is not about having or not having any kind of theological position. What I'm actually hoping to do here is to make the case for prayer without it necessarily needing any of the theological frames we might have been told it depends on. To say that prayer might not always be what we think it is. Because it seems to me that prayer has been part of the ways in which humans have inhabited the world in almost all the times and places we know of apart from around here lately. But that the idea of religion, which we mostly have, is formed, even if only in the negative, by certain versions of Abrahamic monotheism, primarily Christian versions. Like even our category of religion is created by people who were definitely culturally and often religiously Christian, going around the world and attempting to make sense of and put into boxes the ways in which other people lived their lives and related to the layered reality of the world as a bad version or a different version of this thing that they knew from Christianity. And I think that that might be an unhelpful category, an unhelpful way to go about making categories for talking about all of this stuff. So I don't want to go down the simple God-bashing route of either the Dawkinses, Hitchenses and other Inses, <laughs> nor the other God-bashing route of pagans and anti-Civ anarchists for whom all the ills of human history can be laid at the door of the nearest cathedral. You know, Some of my best friends are atheist pagan anarchists, but for me personally, it would be too simple. It would get me off the hook too easily to see the traditions that have been so formative to the culture I came out of, to the loudest, shrillest, and most unrepentant mm. representatives of Christianity and the rest of it. Yeah, it really is about getting on your knees, though, isn't it? I mean, there's there's actually nothing humble about either of those forms of God bashing you just described. You also make me thinking of uh, my late father, who, as as godfather to um, slightly famous actress Olivia Coleman um, once wrote to her and said, as your godfather, the only advice I can give you is to pray. <laughs> but, wow. Uh, <laughs> but biologically, uh, there's something very primal about kneeling. You know, it's this classic mammalian non-verbal communication. Anyone who's got a dog or has seen some of the, the documentaries about chimpanzees can, you know, both those animals reduce their height to convey submission. So we literally make our bodies smaller. We, we small ourselves up. Uh, and we do that to show respect and esteem and deference. But it also makes us more vulnerable uh, and can be interpreted as a request for protection. Uh, so, you know, it's an entreaty. And in religion, it was the raising of the hands into the air that connected us to heaven. But interestingly, the original intention of kneeling was about connection to the underworld realm. Uh, now, there's a grounding for you. Um, before it became the more familiar demonstration of humility that we, we interpret it as today. 
and also politically taking the knee has become a very powerful mm. position of respectful protest. And I, I was brought back to our attentions by American footballer Colin Kaepernick's profound stance against police violence on unarmed black Americans, which arguably, you know, helped seed that simmering Black Lives Matter movement in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the murder of so many others. So to kneel is actually an act which is full of deep biological, behavioural, spiritual and political energy. It, and it's also mythical, um, going back to, to Martin Shaw, who writes in Smoke Hole about how this is perhaps where we really need to begin. And he says, let's start by kneeling down, because the thing I'd love to talk about is beneath us. It's a little worn, possibly with hurt feelings, but it's there. And it's a prayer mat, because we're all praying to something. There's no one size fits all mat. There are countless millions of prayer mats and every last one is different. There's just enough room for you to kneel on and that's about it. And Martin talks about the magical, mythical simplicity of the attention we might give to that prayer mat. Taking attention is a prayer, as I said earlier, to the next level. And he says, it, it may not look like much, not with all these other distractions, but we make things holy by the kind of attention we give them. Because, as he goes on to say, when you forget what you kneel upon, you are far more easily influenced by energies that may not wish you well. And there's something extremely important there, isn't there, about the lack of appreciation and gratitude for what's underneath the cultural hummus. And it doesn't matter whether you try to slice that figuratively, literally, terrestrially, uh, ecologically, ancestrally, or indeed mythically, getting down on our knees and our prayer mats in respect and reverence of all that lies beneath us. So one text that's been helpful for me in all of this is an essay that Matt Osmond wrote for Dark Mountain issue 17 called Black Light. It's about the artist Myra Craighead and her depictions of the Black Madonna. Matt I think he says this in the essay, but I know it from our conversations as well. He grew up with a certain version of Anglican Christianity as part of the background of his childhood. And there's a bit in the essay where he writes, Suppose the dying religion I was raised within were understood as a nurse log, a fallen ancestral giant slow releasing its nutrients from whose decaying body a tangle of adaptive cultures is even now emerging. Such new regenerative shoots might turn out to have less to do with belief or exhausted argument than with recovered behaviours, behaviours which allow us to entrust our lives to mystery, to the unearned gift of being here at all. Mm. And it feels to me like there's something here worth tracking, this idea that you know, behaviours that we might think of prayer as a, a behaviour rather than simply as an act of belief that can be represented in the terms we've been told to think about religious belief in. And that there might be something going on and coming alive around behaviours that come from or have been located within the big edifices of religion and that are kind of travelling their own way at this moment in time. It's also, it's just an extraordinary image, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's an extraordinary image which really chimed. I mean, I love I love that term, nurse log. Um, and on a personal level, it makes me think of my late father, um, my late brother, resting eternally in their natural burial grounds uh, as literal fallen ancestral and fraternal giants from whose decaying bodies and lives a tangle of adaptive emotions, feelings, insights and wisdom is still emerging. Yeah, I can't believe them back to life through exhausted argument or futile resistance to the pain of their loss. But what I can do, and indeed strive to do, is live the very best of their recovered behaviours, to keep those aspects of them alive that I adored, treasured and valued. And in the sense that Matt's describing, their lives have already been entrusted to the mystery, which makes me 
appreciate the unearned gift of still being here at all all the more. Yeah. There's something we're getting to that maybe relates to that sense of there being a set of moves of prayer. So alongside blessing, another is thanksgiving. You know, that expression of gratitude, practices of of gratitude personally and collectively that orient us towards encountering the world as a gift rather than taking it for granted or treating it as an entitlement. And then another of the moves of prayer is to be able to hold those who are suffering or grieving. In this past few months, I've encountered a lot of loss and grief in different circles that I'm part of. And I've been aware that just as we lack the words and gestures of blessing, we also lack a common language in which to, you know, to pray for each other in these moments. There are things that you can't do by another means. And I glimpsed enough of this growing up around churches to have an appreciation for what it can mean to pray for someone in a difficult time. And I mean, part of that, I think, is that when they work, the words and forms of prayer can allow us to hold someone in their time of suffering without putting them under a painfully personal spotlight. So going back to Matt Osmond and his image of the nurse log, of life being born out of the ruins of dying traditions, He traces his own journey from those early Anglican roots through decades of Buddhist practice to his surprise at finding himself part of something called the Way of the Rose, an interfaith rosary fellowship with a subversive mission to come together in reclaiming this old grassroots mother devotion from the various weaponized agendas she's been enlisted to. They call it a rewilding of the rosary. So this is a group of people, most of whom wouldn't call themselves Christians, who've taken up what we'd ordinarily think of as a Christian prayer tradition. And I find that really interesting. Mm, That feels a little less like the slightly competitive back-to-the-source arguments uh, between pagans and Christians that you alluded to earlier. I feel a bit more like digging down to the deeper common ground. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's common ground exactly, You know, in the 20th century, there was this movement called traditionalism that was kind of looking for the single underlying unity behind the world's different religious traditions. And I, in that sense, I think what we're digging down to isn't some common underlying real version of things so much as just digging in the living soil that you happen to to find yourself on. Dara Malloy talks about bioregional spiritualities. I remember being really struck the first residential course that we did with a school called Home. At some point, you know, we had a couple of people who were uh, actively Christian within the group and people who were coming from other different religious traditions. And we also had some people for whom like Christianity had been part of the background of their early life and something they'd left behind a long time ago who would find particular words or phrases or even songs coming up and being brought into the mix of what we were bringing together. And remember one of them, Kate, talked about composting God. (laughs) So maybe that's the kind of soil that we're, we're digging into. And then I think of other examples I've seen of these kind of behaviors, you know, breaking loose and manifesting in ways that aren't held easily within the confines of the traditions and authorities that might seem to have a a monopoly on them. Beloved Sarah Zoltash, who prays the call, which is her version of the Islamic call to prayer, part of the tradition that she comes out of. But I've witnessed her teaching this and leading people in it and breaking open the words and sharing what each of the words and statements within that means to her in a way that opens it up and makes it welcoming to people who Mm. uh, would not and don't have any need to identify as Muslim. There's something incredibly moving about the prayer that Sarah has been making in that way. I think of a conversation that I watched online between Jay Springett, 
the JMO and Gordon White of Rune Soup, the kind of chaos magician, blogger, conspiracy theorist who I talk about sometimes. Gordon makes the case that the prayers of the Christian tradition do not belong to the church, or not only, that they have been used over centuries and centuries by people in all sorts of other contexts. That if your ancestors come from Europe, then these are part of your ancestral tradition. They've been prayed in fields and around campfires and over the sick and at times of joy. And I think of Alan Garner's novel Strandloper and the kind of rituals taking place in the church to which the priest is not invited that use some of the language of the church and some of the language of some very other traditions and beliefs. And that's been part of you know folk magic and part of everyday life for many centuries. And it's possible to step into that and reclaim parts of that without that having to bring all of the burden of the mm. the big superstructure that has been built over that by the powerful institutions of religion. Yeah, it's a bit there's a little bit of a chicken and egg argument there, isn't there, which came first, the church or the prayer. <laughs> um one of my favourite actually non-European examples of those everyday prayers is the Hawaiian Ho'oponopono. And it's an ancient practice of forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, which is essentially about the resolution of relationship issues, you know, be they between people or across one another uh, with the gods or with our ancestors, with the earth, or even actually with yourself. And its purpose is to allow forgiveness to flow so it's really about taking individual responsibility for what shows up in your own reality, whilst at the same time forming a foundation of indivisible unity uh, and connection. And, and in that way, it's actually an echo of the mess out there is due to a mess in here quote that we touched on earlier, because it's based on a principle of as within, so without, whereby cleansing your own consciousness contributes to the cleansing of the collective consciousness. So when you forgive others, you yourself are forgiven. And in like the best prayers, actually, you know, the door is open, as you were saying earlier, it's deceptively simple and memorable. And it just goes, I'm sorry, forgive me. Thank you. I love you. And the very words themselves echo that symbolic process of release. So there's humility, there's entreaty, there's gratitude, and then obviously love. And I've personally found that practice gently and, and beautifully brilliant through some of the torrid trials and tribulations I've been through over the last few years of midlife strife. And uh, and for me, it's, it's definitely one for the prayer mat. Yeah, it gives take it to the mat a whole new meaning. Take it to the mat. Doesn't it? Take like it life mat. takes you to the mat sometimes <laughs> yeah i notice how often the poems that we share in these podcasts actually take the form of prayers like lucille clifton's blessing for the boats that i read a few weeks ago is exactly that a prayer of blessing like maybe these are some of the places where as the structures of religion got hollowed out for us in modern societies uh, the needs that those structures have met at times didn't go away Sometimes they're going unmet, and sometimes the ways they're being met are taking refuge in other places, not least in, in the arts. And I found myself going back to Martin Shaw again this week as well, and it's interesting to notice how often prayer comes through as something that Martin talks mm -hmm. and writes about. And I went back to a text he wrote called A Council of Love and Resistance, which I think was written like the morning after the Brexit referendum vote. And in, in that he said become a prayer maker. Why? Because what you face in your life is bigger than you can handle. It is. Go to a place with shadows and privacy and just start talking. There is some ancient friend that wants to hear from you. No more dogma than that. Use your simple holy words, then sit, listen, go for a walk. Let in. You know, Martin and I, we don't necessarily talk about it that often. Both of us, our dads are ministers. I, we both know that the things that we do owe a great deal to what we learnt growing up in and around churches. 
even if the form that they take, the words that we use, the direction in which we kneel, might look at least on the surface a little different. And I've had conversations with Martin about you know, the Baal Shem Tov. One of my favourite stories he tells is this tiny little story about the Baal Shem Tov, this Jewish story about prayer and thankfulness. And I know that I, Sufism is also really important for Martin. And when he talks about the friend in that passage, uh, you don't need anything, you don't need any more answer to what you're addressing your prayers to than the friend. I, I know that that's a way of speaking about God in Sufism. It's also there in that passage about Pan from The Wind in the Willows that you read to us mm. last season. How's your prayer life, Ed? Mm. Well, that is a good question. Well, the muddy Chet, which I now sit above, does have a wind in the willows feel about it, that's for sure. And there's definitely a, a cloven hoofed footprint or two to be found in the soft banks where a certain piper might have trodden um, at the gates, maybe around about dawn. I've actually been feeling like my feeding of the birds on and around the river has been like a, a little ritual prayer offering or blessing this last couple of weeks. I, I started putting my daughter's breakfast crusts out for the fat pigeons. It was a sort of strange avian reminder of my London life, uh, the ubiquity of pigeons. And then the mallards uh, started joining in and you're, and you're never alone when there's corvids about and they seldom want to miss out on the action. So then there were crows and a jay. And then I had this wonderfully odd encounter with a blue tit uh, whilst gazing out of the fourth floor window of the mill. And I was just looking out across the roof tiles during a phone call. And this blue tit flew onto the ledge outside and just sat about four inches from my nose on the other side of the glass and just stared at me. And I, I paused on the call. And the person on the other end of the line so asked if I was still there. And I said, I said, yes, yes, I am. But I'm just having a moment with a blue tit. <laughs> and, and, and then there's a pair of mute swans that the previous owners had made sure that I would promise to feed. Uh, and they cruised up actually yesterday evening, hissing hungrily below the back deck in expectation. So Claire and I fed them happily before bedtime um, in that sort of soft late evening spring sunshine, which was coming through the willows, uh, of course. So Kenneth Graham would have been very at home. But the crowning glory, I guess, was the kingfisher, uh, which popped up over morning coffee uh, around six o'clock the other morning. And I'd never seen one before. And suddenly there was this majestic but diminutive bird, which was all iridescent, electric blue and bright, bright orange, which is quite the colour scheme for a hunter. <laughs> but then I guess when you plunge suddenly down onto an unsuspecting fish beneath the surface of the water. It doesn't really matter how modishly garish you are because they're not going to see you coming. And this bird flew up from the water and just sat on the rope along the edge of the deck and fixed me with this beady little eye for a long moment before flying low all the way up the river and around the bend. And I mentioned that little sort of collection because each of those moments has in its own way been about presence, but also about attention as a prayer and somehow a deepening of the connection with this place and my intimate wild neighbours. And it's felt like a bringing of myself back down to earth, you know, perhaps even to my knees um, in deference and respect to all of life's wonderful little interdependent riches. And I'm there on my own prayer mat, which for me, I think is a magic carpet that has traveled very widely there's the privilege again, um, is a little thin and threadbare in places from the wear and tear of life. And it's got frayed edges beyond the tartan weave. But it's my mat and I love it. I'm glad you talked about those encounters with birds. So I've got three things that I want to bring in as we bring this episode to a close. And the first one is a few lines from a poem by... John Paul Davis, who's doing this series. So each morning in my inbox via Substack, I get a little poem that he's written. He's writing a poem a day for a year and they're called Small Magic. 
and there are often birds figuring in John's poems and I think in his prayer life as well. And one of my favourite poems so far in the series is called Epigenetics. So I'm going to read a few lines from that. Do our ancestors watch us from the afterlife? And if so, are the agrarian generations in my lineage as befuddled by my life (laughs) as I am? My own grandfather wouldn't know what to make of a smartphone or streaming television or my strange faith cobbled together from so many sources, like soup made from what's about to go bad in the fridge, a cabinet of magic to most of my distant family. I do pray if talking to an invisible possibility counts. I sing to empty rooms. I make wishes, touching wood, and think rabbits are messengers from another world, not just the breathing ones, but also even sculptures and pictures and this carving from walnut my grandfather whittled for my grandmother and my sister stole to smuggle to me long after they died. And I whisper to it sometimes, because what else would those big ears be for? if not for listening. Mm. I love those lines about my strange faith cobbled together from so many sources, <laughs> like soup made from what's about to go bad in the fridge. Yeah, life is a minestrone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then I, for anyone who hasn't found it yet, my second thing to end on is Prentice Hemphill's podcast, Finding Our Way. I listened to the first series. I back to back in January and just soaked it up. And this is coming from people who've been at the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US. And it's seriously reflective, relational, radical, warm, moving, difficult conversations. And and what made me think of it today is that one thing that strikes me listening to those conversations between people who are mostly coming from Black queer, feminist currents of thought and activism in the US, I am really struck by the ease with which they draw on the language of God or the divine, that that's part of the vocabulary. It's part of what's up their sleeves. And I think that's part of what I found inspiring as I listened along to it. And when I went to check the website this morning, I discovered that Prentice has a new season going out right now. So that's what I'm going to be listening to on my headphones when I'm out working in the garden this week, which makes me think of the old monastic slogan, whatever it is, work and pray. And maybe that work can be a form of prayer if we're lucky, if we manage to find a way of making it that. And finally, I want to go back to Matt Osmond's Black Light and another passage that grabbed me when I went back and reread that essay. Matt writes, An English Buddhist priest once taught me that in learning to pray, we learn to get smaller, to get lower, closer to the ground that supports us. Of the many valuable things which I've received from the hands of Buddhist teachers, that priest's idea of prayer is the one I hold closest. When we get down to it, All that we are and all that we value in this life comes to us as an unearned gift. And what we cultivate in prayer is a grateful awareness of this condition, which is one of abundance, which is also one of permanent radical dependency. I had a feeling approaching this episode that it might be one of those ones that really divides people, that some people couldn't handle all this talk about prayer might get frustrated or impatient with us. And maybe that's really some part of me that feels that way and is projecting it out (laughs) onto the unknown listener. But when I reread those words of Matt's, they affirm something for me about why getting on your knees feels so central to what we're circling around in these conversations, what it means to be humbled and why that might matter in a moment like the one that we're living in. And I want to say, I would love to hear from anyone listening to this episode to start a larger conversation about prayer, because as I've been talking about it with people in recent weeks, I've noticed how it's kind of taboo, something that lots of people do, but don't often talk about. So yeah, get in touch and tell us how your prayer life is these days, or if we've moved you to 
try getting on your knees for the first time in a while. And in all seriousness, coming from my own poverty of not having better words in which to put it, bless you for listening to these conversations. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. If you're new to the podcast, we'd invite you to check out the journey we've been on over the earlier episodes. In series one, we explored the sense-making stories taking shape through the first months of the pandemic. And series two tracked the altered states of consciousness, being and feeling that we were seeing around us. This is an open-ended process, and we're keen to hear from you. So please do comment, ask questions and respond via our Facebook page, The Great Humbling, or on Twitter where Ed is at Frucool. We're grateful to all of you who've been giving ratings, reviews and recommendations and sharing this podcast along your networks. And if you want to get deeper into the territory we explore in these conversations, do check out a aschoolcalledhome.org where you can sign up for live online courses and events. These are extraordinary times, a moment of initiation at a cultural scale. So thank you for being with us on this emergent journey. Mm-hmm.